Welcome to Urban Ebb, Southwest Gwinnett Magazine's podcast, bringing you stories from the heart of our local cities. Each episode, we dive deep into the lives of the dreamers and doers who make our communities vibrant and dynamic. From Peachtree Corners to Norcross, Berkeley Lake to Duluth, join us as we explore the diverse tapestry of voices that shape the essence of urban living. This is Urban Ebb, where work, play, and life converge. Hi, everyone. This is Rico Figliolini, host of this brand new podcast, Urban Ebb. It deals with the covering the area that Southwest Gwinnett Magazine covers, and that's Norcross, Burke Lake, Duluth, and Peachtree Corner. And my first guest, my special guest here, is William Corbin. William Corbin is the executive development, well, the economic development director of the city of, of Norcross. Um, there's a lot of things that we're going to try to cover in this episode. So William has been good enough to be able to make himself available to my series of questions. And this is a conversation we're going to have about all sorts of topics. So but the first thing first, I don't know how many people know what um, an economic development director does and also a little bit about William. So William, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. Thank, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Don't ask me too hard questions, you know, but I'll try to answer anything to the best of my ability. Again, my name is William, William Corbin, Economic Development Director here at the City of Norcross. And I am actually originally from up north. I'm from Connecticut, around where you're from, I believe, New York. Yeah. Yeah. And it was too cold for me, so I came down here, went to Emory University undergrad a while back. I won't date myself. And I'm older than I look. But went to Andrew Young School of Policy at Georgia State for my Master of Public Administration. And I enjoy helping to, you know, affect the daily lives of, of residents and, and, and citizens, you know, and that's what that's what we do in, in the policy world, I call it. And, and, uh, and economic development, you know, is about jobs, right? It's about jobs and growth, hence the name economic development. There's a lot of different things. It's a very holistic field nowadays, but it did start off with recruitment companies for jobs. But right. as it pertains to Norcross, what we do here uh, and what we're doing in the economic development department is three main things, okay? Number one, we're communicating and we're engaging with the business community. Number two, we are helping to facilitate um, and responsibly direct investment um, to commercial and residential development. And number three, we do you know programmatic uh, things, programmatic items, things like for example, when COVID happened, we used some of our American Rescue Plan Act funds to support a nonprofit grant program as well as a small business grant program. So that's something that, you know, programmatic that we might do. So that's kind of yeah. kind of Yeah, I noticed that we covered a bit of that when I saw that come out. It was kind of cool because the you know, in COVID with all the funding that came through the federal government and the fact that they let the city to, you know, bring it down to the local level. Uh, to find yeah. who really needs it because you know i mean the fed can't the fed the, fed right. can't. <laughs> can't the united can't. states federal government no they um did you know fun fact this is a, it was the first time i believe that every municipality received funding from the federal government i think in this case it was the department of the treasury and yeah so over i forget how many thirty six thousand. i forget there's a lot of municipalities in the united states but every yeah. one got direct payments from the federal government, which had never happened before. So, you know, the pandemic was definitely something unique, at least unique in our lifetime. I know there's been yeah. pandemics before, but. But, but. but you're right. Living through that, we learned a lot. Businesses learned a lot. There were businesses that survived because of that COVID funding. And then, and then maybe, hopefully, survived after that. And there were quite a few, apparently. But there were also those that just, you know, I mean, they survived, but then a year later, maybe they were gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not sustainable. I remember one of the businesses was a uh, restaurant, fairly big restaurant, and their 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 nut was fifty thousand a month between rent and, mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah, wow. Yep. I think they got maybe fifty thousand grants. That was it. So that lasted a month. I mean, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, diff difficult thing. And and I'm glad that you gave an introduction to what your job is because. A big big difference for a lot of communities to have a lot of cities don't always or don't have an effective person in that job let's say a lot of smaller smaller towns yeah 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 it can make a difference so 
we're going to discuss in, in our time together a bit about the different things that, that you touched upon, some of the different things that, that affect the city. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about was affordable housing, the sure. opportunities that are out there, the challenges that Norcross faces in, in doing this. So tell us a bit about where the city is, is on that. Um, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Affordable housing, as as we know, it's become a, a more significant issue, and, you know, especially in the last three, three to five years, let's say. And it's been a crisis for, for most communities, pretty much every community in the nation is trying to, to grapple with how to address the housing shortage and the housing. I don't, disparity is not the right word, but there's not enough variety of price points. And, and housing types. And so in the city of Norcross, we're faced with this same issue. And the mayor and council, they, they've been very supportive of trying to tackle that issue. For example, we actually are part of a program called the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing. And it's called GIC for short, G-I-C-H. And it's a public-private partnership. Well, it's a, it's a partnership, I would say, between University of Georgia administers the program along with the Department of Community Affairs, Georgia, Georgia, state of Georgia, Department of Community Affairs. And so it's a three-year program where cities and communities apply to who are interested in really tackling these issues. And you learn best practices. You learn about what other cities are doing to address the issue in a variety of different ways. And the benefit of that also, in addition to all the knowledge gained, there's a whole team, you know, of community members and staff kind of involved. You also get a one point towards the application from developers who are doing a, they're trying to, let me back up, low-income housing tax credits are run through Department of Community Affairs. Okay. And so it's a competitive process for developers to obtain funding that, you know, that, that cheaper funding for it. So as an incentive for communities to get better at affordable housing, if you're part of this program, you're able to give a letter of support and points towards that competitive process if a developer is doing something in your community that year. So we were fortunate enough to actually get when two low-income housing tax credit affordable housing projects in the city of Norcross. The first one is uh, the Norcross Housing Authority with Walton Communities. They are redeveloping their 40 odd unit um, um, a property down off Mitchell Road. And they're, they're redeveloping in, into about 180 units, I believe. 90, 90 units in phase one and 90 units in phase two. And so that's gonna really help densify, you know, that area in terms of helping to add housing that's affordable to the city. And that's the Norcross Housing Authority, which is federally funded. Uh, there's another project, the second one is, it's from Blue Ridge Atlantic Development. That's a developer, I believe they're out west, but anyway, they won also the one tax credit to do a 70 unit development right behind the retail office fronts or retail fronts on Beaver Ruin and Beaver Highway. So right behind there, there's gonna be 70 units going up to the caliber collision between, between there and 70 units, and it's gonna be a senior veteran project. So that's very cool. We're excited about that. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so 180 uh, uh, units for the housing authority. We've got uh, 70 units for senior and veterans, and also Alliance Residential Company, who has done a lot of work in this area. You may be familiar with the Broadstone development, Broadstone yeah. Junction in Norcross, was was a former West Rock plant, 10 acres, 100, almost 400 units, and they're also doing Alliance Broadstone Peachtree Corners right on Peachtree yeah. Parkway right yep. there uh, before the forum. So they're active in the area and they were happy to announce or not announce, but there's dirt moving right now, right behind the CVS on Beaufort Highway. There's, there's multiple stories going up for 280 units. Um, it's gonna be called Pros Norcross. Now Pros is their workforce housing product. They're meaning Alliance Residential Company. So, and that's intended to be 20% lower in terms of asking rates for, for rental rates than the, than the surrounding areas. So they're trying to address and help the affordable housing, you know, by their building processes. So that's a different. So how do you, so for example, I, I, affordable housing is an interesting thing, right? Because 
affordable as one person's affordable and another person. Yeah, has. yeah, sure, yeah. And and I can appreciate what you said before because, in like for example, in the city of Peachtree Corners, almost it seems like almost every housing thing that goes up, mm -hmm. townhouse, half townhouse, stuff like that, is always north of six hundred thousand. Oh yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and and like for example, and maybe town center is a bad example of this, but. There's a lot of townhouses there, right? There's about 80 that mm -hmm. were built there. I think they went north of 750,000. They mm -hmm. rent for easy $3,400 a month, if not more. Wow. It's really not affordable to most work people. No, not at all. And, and if anything's not affordable to a middle class person either, or even a slightly up middle class. I don't know if that's I mean, we have to, I think household income has to be north of 200,000 mm -hmm. to pay that money. Uh -huh. So how do you keep, so where are the price points for the affordable housing? And how do you, on those, those are owner-occupied? Uh, these are the ones I mentioned. Those are all multifamily. Those will be rentals. No oh, rentals. None of them. Oh, rental, yes. Yes. No condos. You know, we found that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we want to continue to have different varieties. So you want to have some rental units. You want to have for sale. It's very difficult right now to do for sale also. And I know you mentioned this before about there's challenges with affordable housing. The land costs, the land costs are just so high that in order to get a return, um, you know, it's it's hard to, to pencil that financially, you know, in terms of the, the revenue for the developer. So it's you need subsidies or at least an hour way of doing things. Right. Right. You need subsidies or you would need to, you know, from my experience and from what I've seen in other places, you would need to say, okay, you're a developer, you want some density, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You're going to put 200 units there. But it would also be great if you did 20 units that are affordable, equity-owned units. Right, say. right. Uh, yep. That fall yep. below a certain price range and maybe provide that land to not you build it because maybe your costs are a little higher, but maybe a habitat for humanities or different mm -hmm. similar organizations to come in to say, okay, we're going to do provide 20% or you know, 20% of the thousand is going to be debt. I could see the, the rental thing because you're right. I mean, your property is expensive depending with, depending where yeah. that property is actually, yeah. right? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, all over the place here. And the thing in with Norcross, we're close to the city. We're already built out. It's not like we have just raw land and acreage out yeah. in the country that's going to go for lower. So the prices are higher. But to your point, there is, um, you know, th there are things that, that municipalities can do that what you refer to is called inclusionary zoning. And the city of Atlanta has been very aggressive, you know, especially around the Beltline area in trying to make these, those kind of overlay zoning districts where you require a developer for more density to, you know, do, you know, in exchange for more density, for example, to do, you know, affordable housing units at whatever percentage, you know, they work out. So we've actually been kicking that around a bit and staff has been doing some, some, some due diligence and legwork, you know, nothing to announce but you know that's something that we've we've discussed it's one of the options another one is of course buying land and then selling it at a discount discounted rate subsidizing mm -hmm. so. city the city does own a 10 and a half acre piece of property off mitchell road right mm -hmm. south of the texaco gas station okay. on the right side you know past the power line easement okay. um it's 10 acres you can't really see it. there's a gate there it's wooded yeah. but we are looking to dispose of that property for the redevelopment of affordable housing in some way. So we're the, the Norcross Development Authority, which is a citywide development authority, they have control of the property. And so they're they're exploring their options with, you know, various outfits. Well, so. uh, to get back to the rental part, the affordable rental, what's the mechanism? Mm -hmm. How do you work that, you know, price range? I know you said 20% less in the market. Well, that's that's the Alliance. That's the Alliance Residential's pros okay. product. Right. Their Broxstone project is their the market rate. So but how, how, did that? Was so that? I was going to say, how do you how do you monitor that? That and how do you and where is that price range? Well, you know, typically, yeah. What happens is usually when you're doing an affordable housing development, or you see that there's sustained affordability, you have a an organization that is contracted by the developer or by the apartment, you know, company to, 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 to vet the applications coming in. And also if it's owner occupied, for right. example, you can do the same thing with, you know, deed restrictions, et cetera. There's a lot of, there's some complicated things, but there's ways that you can extend the affordability and 
so that the people that own it can get some more equity out of it. There's a percentage. There's all kinds of formulas of this. But basically, an organization like Winnet Housing Corporation, they are, they are a private developer, but they develop affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And so they will partner with builders to buy property and build. And that's usually for sale. So they've been looking around in the Norcross area. Um, and actually, funny enough, they're doing a project now. And this is how the Norcross Development Authority was kind of resurrected. We were statutory, statutorily, we had it, but if we didn't have a full board. We didn't have a board at all. So there was a Gwinnett Housing Corporation, actually, funny enough, they were looking to do a project next to the Norcross High School, okay? Whereby, yeah, yeah, whereby they would have a townhome community that, you know, looks like every anything else, right. but it would service students and families who are in need or may have been in extended stays which we do have a good amount of, and there are families that are in there. And so spending a lot of money, um, you know, when they yeah. really have to, you know, just because of the, the market and how that, that works there. So that was a project that they were looking to do. However, they needed someone to help facilitate the transfer of land. Now, cities legally can't buy and dispose, buy and sell land. You have to do it through a development authority in the state law. We only had a downtown development authority that was active. And that was only, of course, in the downtown area. So when I first came to the city of Norcross, which was in November of 2019, I believe it is, that was one of the things that I heard, hey, they wanted to do, do that. I said, and you know what? I wonder if we could do a citywide authority, you know, development authority. Usually development authorities, not DDAs, but development authorities are counties. That's how they started county-based. So you see a lot of counties have development authorities, okay. development authority of you know, Clayton County, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we were able to do that. I, you looked through the, you know, with our attorneys and we figured out, hey, there are some cities that have, you know, city of Decatur, they have a citywide development authority, for example. And so we, we, you know, implemented ours. It ha just so happens that the development authority wasn't needed for that project. That project is moving along, you know, thankfully without the development authority, but now we have a citywide development authority to, to help all areas of the city and not just the downtown area. And our citywide development authority, which is called the Norcross Development Authority, NDA, not right. non-disclosure agreement, yeah. but right, right. they are focused on housing. That's one of their initiatives. They can do anything that, that they have similar powers to the DDA, mm -hmm. but they have their focus is more, you know, housing efforts. And that's why they have control of that property on Mitchell Road that I okay. referred to earlier. So, so even broader authority, if you will, than a, because there are also like redevelopment authorities where they mm -hmm. redevelop old property or buildings. And right, stuff. right, and right. Yeah. Yours, your idea actually has broader powers, I guess. And yeah. A broader mission, if you will. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of flexibility in that, you know, so it does. Okay, cool. Housing's a, a big thing to every city, you know, and certainly Snow Cross, Peachtree Corners, none of these are different. Unless, of course, you like Berkeley Lake, maybe, which is already. Yeah. In, in that, I love Berkeley know. Lake. I love yeah. it. I love, I love our neighbors. We're, you know, we all have different, you know, positive things and different unique yeah. things about us yeah. that, that makes the Southwest Gwinnett area great, you know. And, and going back to what you said about developed little land that can be developed. I mean, Peach Corners is like that to a degree, right? There's no, we're, we're not, like you said, a rural place. Anymore. Yes. We're, we're an urban environment. Right, and that comes with challenges, yeah. yeah. More urbanization, more of every other thing that comes with being in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. Redeveloping, like, you know, maybe uh, office buildings that aren't going to be used anymore. because Which is a thing hybrid, now. Yeah, it's a hybrid world, and I don't, yes. I honestly don't think that part's going to go away. It's going to adjust, I think. But, no, no, it's not. But let, let me tell you something about that, though. Yeah. So we... we you know, we have a couple of those buildings, you know, usually that that challenge has we haven't had that challenge of vacancy with our mm -hmm. medium and lower priced uh, office office buildings. There's a lot of people doing entrepreneurship. There's a lot of smaller companies that are growing. And, you know, places like Viridian Business Plaza over off of Jimmy Carter going up to the racetrack, you know, that's entry level space. You know, no, it's not the class A shinier space, but it serves a great purpose in terms of helping companies grow. And you know, as well as a lot of folks that are in this air industry, that 70% of, of job growth comes from small businesses. So, yeah. you know, and, and 
I kind of went off tangent a little bit, but I was trying to talk about the, the, the office, you know, the office that the bigger office buildings, those are the ones yeah. that have those vacancy issues now with the new realities. And so, you know, we've got one right on the corner of Holcomb Bridge and Peach Industrial Boulevard, four story building, 73,000 square feet. You know, we were kind of contemplating how do we help redevelop that? Because it was yeah. it's been empty for some time or only That's only the floor has been used. And so, you know, that building I hear may be occupied by a new user that will actually utilize most of the building. Oh, and it's good. a yeah, I can't I can't say but I believe it's an engineering type of firm. So hopefully, you know, we'll continue. We'll hear good news on that in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so, but that we were looking to redevelop that property, you know, or, or, or brainstorming ideas of how to redevelop that into something maybe with, maybe with a commercial tilt to it, you know, because you're, you're, right behind using, it. using the same building versus gutting it out or tearing it down. You know, maybe we explored that too. I, you know, got some retail consultants that, you know, I like to kind of bat some ideas around and sure. that's not as easy as everyone. It's not as easy as everyone might have originally thought, you know, you you heard a couple of years ago, oh, you know, let's just convert. But there's a lot of issues with engineering and plumbing and et cetera. Right. So oftentimes, unless it's been vacant for a while and it's maybe blighted, the property's too valuable, you know, to it's too difficult to put money, more money into it in addition to the land costs right. to, to redevelop it. So in that case, if that were to redevelop, it would probably be a takedown. Right. And I would, I could probably see Mix up, you know, a smaller office, you know, maybe a smaller, you know, 15,000 square feet of office sure. space with co-located restaurant space or because, you know, right across the street, you've got retail, TJ Maxx, Publix. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. in mode now, but but that's, you know, it's exciting that that kind of thing would have yeah. been really cool. But but it's also cool that it remained a job generator and, it's, you know, hopefully still going to be filled with 100, 200 folks hopefully coming in to work there. So, yeah, yeah that's that, really that's yeah, that's the best part when you get someone else coming in, private business doing it, yeah. right? Right. Uh, because even just pulling it together, I know the forum when North American yeah. Properties bought that in Peter yeah. Corner, the, the whole idea of adding density there, of doing apartments and then the hotel yep. and adjusting the retail space uh, takes time. That, it that does. can be, you know, people look at that and say, it'll be done, you know, wow, we're going to have that, you know, takes a little time. It takes it's a little take, bit. Like, Two or three years, maybe, you know. Yeah. They go in phases and make sure that they do their, yeah. their research right. And But I like what they're doing over there. It's good. It's it's good for the entire area, you know. Sure. You know, everyone's like, oh, are you, you guys competing with Peachtree Corners? Yes and no, you know, because a lot of the a lot of the companies that are over there, I talk to, you know, they come here for lunch. They go to oh, yeah. Peachtree Corners Town Center for lunch. So it's it's good. Growth, growth in Peachtree Corners, growth in Duluth, growth in Berkeley Lake yeah. is great. It, it, it helps everyone within that that ecosystem because yeah, everyone has something a little different too. You know, I mean, your downtown area is a lot different than yes. our downtown area that we're growing. Mm -hmm. And that's a good part about North American properties looking at at holistic, like you mentioned before. Right. That it's not just a retail place, right? Mm -hmm. So housing is one big thing, but you can have housing. But with that transportation, in a way, it's kind of hard mm -hmm. to get around, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Gwyneth, I come from the North like you do, right? I come from New York, from Brooklyn. Subways okay. were, were a big thing until they weren't. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm 65 next year. So I lived through Koch at Koch. I lived through mm -hmm. uh, Giuliani, who took over as mayor at one point. But he, when he took over, the subway system was atrocious. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to go on it. I remember. I remember. I'm an eighth. <laughs> 1983. So my youth, I remember going to visit family, and it was yeah, it's, it was different in the early 90s, early 80s. God I used to take the train up on uh, the IRT up the east side of Brooklyn mm -hmm. uh, through you know, where that area was called, and it was all abandoned buildings, and mm -hmm. the you were just fearful for your life to some degree because depending on what time you came home, wasn't the best place to be on. Right? Nah, nah. So there are a lot of people that moved here into Gwinnett County, obviously. But even with that, I think they picked this area because of the way it is. And I know Gwinnett, there are some people that would like to bring martyr into Gwinnett County. Mm -hmm. I have young young kids, well, yeah, they're in their 20s. They keep saying to me, why spend a billion or $2 billion to bring four miles of martyr into, mm -hmm. you know, into, into Gwinnett County? 
Makes no sense to me. Uh, rapid systems, buses, light rail, maybe. I don't think mm -hmm. we need to be doing like heavy billion dollar mm -hmm. pieces of work. But so they are challenges. So how does Norcor see these types of challenges? I know you, you all, you know, might be into like the bus rapid transit or what is that? The, I forget the uh, new in the library or, or oh, we're, yeah. not, we're not trying to put something else, I think at this point, but mm -hmm. you're right, right, right. Yeah. I think it's, but I thought it was bus rapid transit. But that was it. And, you know, which is, you know, not a dedicated way, right, rights of way, but it's not the heavy rail that, that you know, you're we talking about before. So, yeah, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I think we do know that there's going to probably be of another, you know, penny tax or something like that, some kind of uh, initiative or vote asked of the county. And whether it be for heavy rail or not, I think that's the question, right? But the bottom line is we need more, uh, we need more connectivity in that sense and different different types of connectivity in order to help you know you if you've driven around around here if you've driven around on jimmy carter mm -hmm. from Holcomb ridge yeah. all the way down to 85 it's it can be challenging and that actually is one area that's identified as would be a corridor for you know a bus rapid transit route we've been working with the yeah. county they've been doing a lot of focus groups they've been doing uh you know a lot of input gathering about what the possibilities could be and I think they're preparing for, you know, to eventually put something forward that they think they can build consensus with. Yeah. But traffic, yeah, traffic's an issue. It's only getting worse. And there, uh, there, there, was a, there was a modified plan or a plan I saw somewhere that showed where the transit hubs would be because you have to have hubs, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. My only thing with that, and I don't know how you think about it, so I'm going to ask you, but... Uh, yeah. I don't mind, you know, you need these hubs, right? So it's, that's practical. That makes sense. But they tend to be in the, the ones I've seen don't tend to be good looking. They're not mm -hmm. great for okay. the community that's around it, unless they're done a certain way. And I've seen other cities, okay. uh, or, you know, you could Google this stuff and it, it's great because you could see urban planning from other major cities, from mm -hmm. other parts of the world, even where they have the same thing because you're going to need a hub, but they build either residential around it, office, retail. Yeah. So then it's not a little bit more advanced, less, you know, more clean because it's not yes. using diesel engines, it's using sustainable energy. So you're not getting the, the dirt, the soot from a diesel engine and all that. Yeah. You know, it's cleaner than it used to be, but, but you're not getting oil stains. You're not getting all that. And if you can create a, a hub that's more, that has retail, some housing or office, that makes more sense to me now. I agree. But where do you do good? Uh, do Norcross doing that though? Here's yeah. the key with uh, with that, and what you're talking about is what we call transit-oriented development (TODs), and they've been doing that a lot. Marta, you know, they they started that off several years ago. They're out to Avondale Estate Station now, and basically, it's exactly what you said. It's developing mixed use around the transit line and or the transit hub, and so that's that's actually what's not really spoken. With, you know, yes, we want connectivity, but also it's a redevelopment tool that will help address or can help address affordable housing because you can have those more dense stations right. double as housing, as entertainment, as retail, as well, you know. And so I think that's where I think, you know, you, you got it right with it. You got to make it nicer, um, but there's opportunities in there for, you know, to add add different forms of, you know, economic development, different forms, you know, like entertainment, like restaurants. Affordable housing, you know, most importantly. Yeah, yeah. looking holistically towards that. Mm -hmm. So it's a um, triple-edged sword, a double-edged sword. Yeah, it is, for sure. Yeah. And it's not easy, and it takes time, and there's all sorts of red tape mm -hmm. and, and approvals and yeah. all sorts of things. And, and then, of course, politically speaking, to get, a, to get people to uh, agree to this type of stuff. Because there's yeah. still... Can still see a no vote coming at some point. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But, but you know what? Okay. You know, I think they're going to find a happy medium. I'm hoping. I think so. I think so. I think so. But I think it's all in the way it's marketed too. You've got to educate um, the public, and you know it's the timing too. When is it? When is the vote? Is it going to be in a general election? Is it going to be in an off election? Is it going to be in March? Well, so. hopefully they don't pull a political thing where they do it in an off. I think they tried to do it in an off-year election because they thought it might pass better. It still failed. Allegedly. I don't know if that was the case. But yeah, there yeah, was. Yeah, this is true. This is me. My, my political campaign <laughs> in New York. This is what they've done. It. 
You're the one that would have done it in Brooklyn, probably. <laughs> um, I'm a little jaded with some stuff. <laughs> Understand. Yeah. Understand. Yeah. Some people always tell, there was one guy that I knew that I would say, just follow the money because everything's really about the money. No matter how you look at it. Yeah. 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 Let's move on to businesses and how city, you know, we hit some of it, but you know, what, what, what initiatives has the city of Norcross implemented to attract like small new businesses and also mm-hmm. to keep businesses and mm-hmm. the people, you know, companies move and stuff. So what right. initiatives does the city have? So, you know, we, we like to see ourselves economic development as connectors, you know, connecting companies, connecting small businesses to access to capital, for example, connecting them to technical assistance. You know, we've got organizations like Access to Capital for Entrepreneurs or ACE, which we house in one of our city property buildings, you know, at a discounted rate. So they're right here. We also, you know, you have, we have the UGA SBDC or Small Business Development Center right over in Lawrenceville. That's where it's funded by the SBA. That's another resource. And we try to you know, really, like I mentioned before at the beginning, we engage and communicate with the business community, you know, and we go out and we actually, prior to my time here, we had another position that was, what well, was contract, but I wanted to um, really focus on our, what we call our business recruitment and expansion efforts. It's about existing industry. Cause again, I mentioned, you know, small businesses do account for a lot of job growth. And oftentimes when you're visiting these companies, A, they're appreciative. And B, you find things out that you may not know otherwise, you know, about the industry, about what's going on with the workforce, you know, any kind of problems that they're having or challenges and things like expansion, you know, expansion needs. So we've, we found through that and through, you know, touching our businesses, you know, that's, that's, that's a very positive outcome uh, for that. We also work with our, our, our friends at Partnership Winnet. And that is more for the recruitment of outside companies, you know, into the city, into the Norcross area. They work very closely with the State Department of Economic Development and their city partners to kind of help recruit and, and direct direct companies. We have other things like incentives, such as Freeport tax inventory, Freeport inventory tax exemption, whereby companies and warehousing, distribution, e-commerce, they get, you know, I think it's up to all of their taxes in terms of inventory tax, you know, written off. So there's a lot of uh, reasons why you would want to locate in Norcross. We are a logistics and distribution hub, uh, yeah. there's several, several, several parks. And so, yeah. you know, by the way, speaking of industries, we are in the middle of doing a target industry study update, you know, after the pandemic, things have changed a lot. And, you know, we use that, you know, that'll be done hopefully sometime in the spring to kind of redefine how we how we go out, what companies do we want to attract, you know, what what is our workforce like? What's our education levels like? What's our labor force? You know, so yeah. and then match what's growing. And so we're gonna refine those soon. And that's gonna help with with also helping to recruit um and attract companies yeah. instead of, in addition to growing them. Yeah. That may, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean you want to be able to not only it's hard to keep a handle on things in a in a big city, and Norcross is relatively you know big city. Mm-hmm. Um, so to to know exactly what type of businesses have been coming in the last three, four, five years, and what type right. of companies support those businesses, it's important to know that yeah. you can expand on that. I mean, and the fact that you can provide those credits or those initiatives uh, to attract businesses makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Ta- um, credits, tax credits. I didn't mention that actually. We have job tax credits as part of lesser developed census tract, which we have a couple of those. We are able to give, I think it's $3,500 per job for a full-time job off your corporate tax liability. And that can be extended five, 10 years. And so companies do take advantage of that. And that is a incentive that we use um, in addition to, you know, the other one that I mentioned. I would imagine if someone comes in with 200 employees, that's a lot of money. (laughs) Yes, exactly. You're gonna want you're gonna want to take advantage of that, and yeah. we're happy to, to offer that. Cool. The let, let's talk a little bit about you know. I mean, we talk. There's so much talk about clean energy, about EV cars, charging stations. We just set a, a bunch of charging stations in these three corners, new ones. 
Long Beach Recorder Circle. I'm thinking about okay, it. yeah, I think I saw those being put in uh, another yeah. week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's across from Town Center, actually. Okay. Along along with the EV charging stations at the parking deck in Town Center, they're making that more of a requirement with some developments to provide a certain amount of percentage yeah. of EV mm -hmm. charging stations, staff charging stations, I believe. Mm -hmm. So what does the city do as far as uh, uh, friendly business practices, green initiatives? I know you all, a lot of sustainable stuff, LED city. I mean, just those are great things. Do you, what do you do there? And mm -hmm. how do you also try to put that into development work when people come to the city mm -hmm. that we want to do 280 apartments? How do you, you, do you use any of that initiative in those developments to say, listen, we'll give you the density, but you have mm -hmm. to be LED certified the building, or you have to provide a certain amount of sustainable parking, or do you do any of that? Or, or what, what does the city do? Yeah, we, we do do some of that. And before I mentioned that, you know, we, we are, we consider ourselves a green, green city, you know, you know, we have green building practices, energy efficiency, water use. We, we have a trees and green space, you know, committee. So we're doing a lot. You know, I think we are a tree city and a bee city. So we, sustainability is something that we, that we we're proud of. And we, you know, we're building off of that to continue because we know, and here's the, here's the catch. Generation Z, they really care about that. And our young professionals coming in they care about that a lot more than maybe we, or maybe they, they're intentional about putting that into, into, into practice in terms of choosing, choosing where to live, where do you work, et cetera. And we're acknowledge, we acknowledge that and we try to be on the cutting edge of those types of things. Now, fast forward to, okay, how do you do that? We do have some incentives, especially in certain areas of the city where you can, whereby you can, if you use, you know, bicycle racks and things of that nature, if you use, I think it's five elements of green building, you get a density bonus, you know, in terms of if you're doing a project. For example, that project on Buford Highway is part of that zoning area that offers that that incentive. So there's there are incentives that we we try to encourage, you know, all of our our developments uh, to to be as sustainable as possible. We understand that it is it's not as cheap, just no. you know, it's, it costs more. But big picture, a lot of times you get that money back. So if you're um, you know a developer, you know you understand that. But oftentimes it's easiest to go to kind of the whatever's the lowest hanging fruit or just to get the job done. But I think there are developers out there and investors that understand the big picture and the return and the efficiency gains that they can have. You know, interesting. There, think, there, there definitely are developers like that. But I agree with you. There are those that look at that low hanging fruit because eventually they're going to sell that property after they build it. Mm -hmm. None of these developers keep it. Yeah. The flipping it to a read or a different investment company, mm -hmm. but the city has to look at it long term, right? Yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you want do. to make sure that it's going to survive and needs to be doing what it's doing. Yeah, I can see that. Are there other, uh, you know, other ways, other success stories about local business uh, opportunities? You know, local businesses, homemakers, yeah. not homemakers, well, homemakers. Home businesses. Or what we want to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The initiatives. Yeah. So I, I, you guys have like the Norcross Art Gallery. I know there's lots of artists in there. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. We, we are, got a good art scene. We've got like nice, I think we've got a nice local, you know, what I call quality of life businesses, you know, a nice, you know, in downtown. We also have companies like, for example, Refuge Coffee just just opened up not too long ago, you know, and their mission based organization, you know, they do hire refugees and, and individuals of that nature and originally based in Clarkston. And so we're excited for them to to come here and open up. We've also got companies like like Green Boom, which was out of and they are a how do I describe this? They basically are a um, biodegradable they make materials like oil booms to clean up disasters and spills. But it's oil only absorbent. So all the water doesn't absorb any water and also it's biodegradable. So there's 100% sustainability there. So really cool concept. They're going to be growing very, very fast um, and they're going to be expanding. So again, that's a company that started out of Georgia Tech. Uh, and, you know, they are, you know, yeah. yeah. And it's a green company, very cool company called Green Boom. Yeah. And we also have a, hmm? yeah. 
I was going to say, I'll, for the listeners, I'll have those links in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Clean Spark is another company. They're uh, a Bitcoin mm-hmm. mining company off of Brook Hollow Parkway. I don't know if you over by the old Sprint data center. Uh, right off the the company. I own I own some shares of stock in that company. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, they do Bitcoin, but they also invest in low carbon energy, wind, solar, nuclear, hydro. They, they're very very unique kind of company. Bitcoin mining is one thing that they do. So when they use a lot of power, oh which God. is of course good because we are a power providing city we're a utility city we have a norcross power we have a utility company kind of like lawrenceville you have a gas for example so you have norcross power norcross power and if you if you look at the old map well not the old map it's a map but basically our territory is the what used to be you know just norcross big circle kind of between uh, the beaver ruin area carter going down a little bit but fortunately georgia power and jackson emc they have all the good the best kind of Corners on highways and things of that nature. So we're, mm-hmm. we're more in the downtown core area. So of mm-hmm. course, that's an economic development generator. When we have redevelopment in our power service area, that's really, you know, that's a double yeah. for double positive for us. So, but yeah, uh, our is a way to you know, you know, like you said, EV. EV that's an that's an elect- uh, economic development generator. They yeah. say. I'm not so sure about how much it is anymore. I think that Peachtree mm-hmm. Corners, in terms of using EVs for development uh, of your economy, yeah. like people stay there and then they they charge up and then they go and shop in your community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not too sure. It sounds like a great idea, but from my, I guess, unscientific mm-hmm. viewpoint, I see people sitting in their cars on their phones, you know, so maybe it's not as much of a generator, uh, you know, as, as we thought. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah. You may be right that way, but... But it's a cool factor. It is a cool factor. And so there's things that are good about having that. You know, I think that... There's still more people buying EV cars, and they have to charge it somewhere. Now, granted, you know, most people go home and charge it, let's say. Mm-hmm. But if you're traveling to a city or you work in that city, you certainly want to be able to charge it while you're at work, maybe. Yeah. The problem yeah. with those things have always been, I think, where you plug it in and you're, mm-hmm. you know, you're charged up, but... You're still, your car's still parked there. No one else can go park it. Yeah, that's, they're, they're gonna have to figure that out. I've heard that all the new like QTs, racetracks, gas stations, yeah. they are putting the new build ones. They are putting the infrastructure in so that when it, yeah, so they'll be ready to switch it on. And then you're gonna have a whole bunch of gas stations. It's not a gas. What's it gonna be called? We don't know what it's gonna be called. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right? I don't uh, know. But you don't it's have better- for some time. Completely goes away, but, uh, but it yeah, better be, it better be really fast chargers. Yeah, I think they've got the. They know what they're doing. I think they're ahead of the game. You know, the car manufacturers, they are jumping on board. Matter of fact, our educational systems, Gwinnett Technical College, they have a huge. They have, just have a huge new new building or buildings that are dedicated to the automotive partnerships, where they'll train. Uh, students in ev in you know in the traditional automobiles as well yeah. so there's a whole industry that's gonna that's burgeoning where you can use transferable skills if you've already been a mechanic um and in fact what is it called yeah. napa napa genuine auto parts company i guess that's the real name they have a place napa, which we have a they have a place on peachtree industrial boulevard. yeah peachtree industrial boulevard they have a uh, distribution center actually a regional distribution center and there's office space there too i we visited them our business development manager visited them and wouldn't you believe it? They're already starting to tag and they're, they're trying to understand the different parts that are going to come down the pike once people, you know, use and need them more. So they're, everyone's preparing for this shift uh, to EVs. I'm not yet. I'm not ready yet in my, in my household. I want to be able to just get off the exit yeah. and not think about having to look yeah. for charge. So, but as technology gets better, I think more people will adopt. Maybe my next next car. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, I always I would keep a gas car just in case. <laughs> Smart guy. Yeah, I like yeah, that. Like that. <laughs> um, so we've we've uh, we've covered a lot, William. <laughs> Quite a bit. This has been a great discussion. I think going back and forth a bit about about where the city's at, the incentives mm-hmm. you all are doing, 
making the place a great place for businesses to go to, to relocate to, or, or to be growing in. Yes. Um, so yes. It's yes. cool to learn a little bit more about that. Hope to have you on again. You know, Thank you. Talking about other things. Appreciate it. Have, no, I'm glad I had you leading off the first episode of Urban Ab. Good, good. I, I didn't even talk about all the, uh, the the quality of life that's going on, you know, with the restaurants and the new shops. So keep an eye out on our downtown and keep an eye out on some other areas, you know, that may be ripe for redevelopment. So maybe we'll we'll talk some more about that next time once things get more get going more after these interest rates settle down. So yeah, I think we can make this almost like a quarterly episode that sure. we talk to and find out a bit more about Norcross. So so I want to thank you, William. Thanks for being with me. William Corbin from the city of Norcross. Uh, kind of cool, all the Me stuff too. going on there. Uh, thank you guys for listening to us. Obviously, depending where you're listening, do like our Facebook page, Southwest Gwinnett Magazine and Petri Corners Magazine. Look us up on YouTube. We're actually under Petri Corners Magazine, but there's playlists, and this is part of that playlist that will be there. Subscribe to us. Get notifications when these go on a live simulcast stream. At some point, we'll be doing other types of things as well. Q&A, chat rooms where we may be able to take quite a lot of questions uh, and stuff. So, you know, stay subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcasts like Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or, you know, or Audible or anything like that, like us, leave a review. That'll be, we'll, we'll be found better on those things. So thank you again. Appreciate you all being with us. Thank you. Wendy. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Urban Ebb. If you enjoyed today's conversation and want to stay connected with the heartbeat of our local cities, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. If you have a story to share or know someone who does, we'd love to hear from you. The pulse of Peachtree Corners, Norcross, Berkeley Lake, and Duluth beats through the dreams, actions, and stories of some great individuals we feature. Until next time, this was Urban Ebb, your gateway to the heart of urban living.